In this lecture on participatory development, we're building on the last two lectures. On Monday, we talked about the helper and the client. Two people, one person trying to help the other, okay? Second lecture was on Wednesday. We talked about um, community and how to change a community, okay? Um, now we're moving towards uh, what, and that was from the perspective of a general helping theory that applies to the helping professions like psychology, psychiatrists, um, and others, um, and from a, a social work perspective who tries to help fix and improve communities. Okay? Now, what we're going to talk about today comes from a different perspective. Some of the things are going to be repeated, but things are said in a different way. And um, that's because this, this comes out of a, 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 about a 300-page report out of the World Bank. Okay? So this is a, you know, a, an approach to development for an international setting, um, and it's considered, you know, a model for how to go about it, changing a community in a, a good way. Okay, it's to, um, as opposed to other models for how to do that. So this is a, it is is different in a sense than than the past. Each of these three approaches, helper client, which is really engineer client, uh, community development, which is engineering for community development, or participatory development, which means the people participating as a team of engineers and a team, a group of people, okay, working together, that's the way it's defined, is all highly relevant to humanitarian engineering, okay? And you're gonna see some themes, I don't care whether it's a sort of psychology perspective or a social work perspective or sort of a, a World Bank perspective, there's a lot of commonality between these things. There's different things that are emphasized. What I like about the, the lecture today is um, actually some of the things I'm not going to cover, and that is they try to evaluate whether this is the right approach to do development. I mean, the, the World Bank's given out a lot of money, spending a lot of money on development around the world. Okay. They want to know the right approach, so it's the most effective. So it, it's, they take that perspective, okay? It's an evaluative perspective. The, the report is, is at the website, of course, and uh, it is um, quite detailed and has hundreds of references. I mean, it's an extensive um, uh, compilation of, of material um, historically, so I think it's, it's quite useful as a read. Okay, so let's um, jump right into it, just to review. I like these cute little cartoons. So we start at the beginning of that sort of individual development. Then we move towards uh, participatory development. Um, you know, this, this is the, one of the fundamental distinctions in this approach is, is that this is about a bottom-up approach. Bottom-up means you start on the ground with the people working with the people rather than a top-down approach where somebody helicopters in a solution, drops it off, and says, there, thank you very much. Okay, that's, it's done. We fixed the problem. Okay, and they may not, the, the implication, people use that term helicopter approach, um, and what they mean is, is that they have no understanding of what's going on on the ground, period. They just think this is gonna work and just give it, and that's that, okay? So this is really quite different from this. This is more grassroots, bottom up, it involves people, it obeys many of the principles we talked about over the last two lectures with respect to, you know, putting somebody in the driver's seat, or helping rather than service, and things like that. Okay, um, so of course it's feedback control. Everything is in life. So uh, just kidding. Um, but when you read this, if if I can actually get you to understand feedback control, like cruise control and PID for financial advice, it is in here, and it emphasizes the right thing. It is a philosophy too. So you look at the conditions coming out of the community. So these little black boxes might be houses or buildings or, or whatever, and these, might, these are houses, and, and you, you got red and um, um, blue individuals. Uh, let's say the, red, the blue people aren't gonna get involved in this participatory development project, or the red people are going to. Some of those red people, in fact, join over here with uh, this guy right here is the engineer, the black individual, and then the, uh, the green guy is like a government guy or an NGO guy, and work with the local community, okay, to generate activities to try to improve this situation, okay? And you do what's called monitoring and evaluation, that's a very standard term 
in the UN, the World Bank, CARE, UNICEF, whatever. Look at <coughs> this, you monitor, about, and then you evaluate, and then you decide what to do next, okay? Your goals, of course, are social justice goals, right? You want to improve human dignity, you want to get better rights, you want to, you know, get better water so people are healthier, and so on and so forth. And uh, the strategy often involves some planning. That's what this represents. What I mean now is different than the help a client's situation because what's happening now is, is these people are all working together to come up with a plan, okay? And they're trying to execute it. They can't plan too far ahead because there's lots of uncertainty. These external influence, influences make sure that just because people are taking activities doesn't mean that the right things are gonna happen. Something's may go wrong and you may have to replan, okay? And this is, this is very different too, too for two other reasons. One of them is this is a much more complex situation than one person, right? It's much, much more complex. Um, for one, for two, th there's, a, there's a field in feedback control called cooperative control, okay? Well, this is cooperative control. You're taking a group of people and they're trying to work together to decide what to do. All right, they're trying to cooperate, okay? Um, and uh, cooperation is difficult. Getting people to cooperate is difficult, right? Some people are smiling. Think of your own groups, okay? Think of your own groups and your teams. It can be difficult to get people to cooperate, even when it's in, the, when it's in their best interest, right? It can be difficult. So this is a, a, a way to view this and, and, and sort of, combine it with other ideas um, in, in the lectures. So there's a number of types of participation. There's a so-called passive participation where, you know, you sort of sit back and, you know, you might get in a, a focus group to the, with the village to talk about what needs to be done and you might just listen, okay? You, you may not contribute at all. Then there's consultation where, you, you, you know, you ask people, you consult with people and ask them for advice. Walk around the village, ask people or ask people in a, in a group setting, like a focus group. Then there's a collaboration. That means somebody's gonna actively participate. They're gonna work. They're gonna do something on the ground. They're gonna you know, give sweat, right? Or they're gonna give money, or they're gonna give their time something, all right? So they're gonna work together. Uh, and then there's, the, the, the authors call this empowerment participation, which is essentially people work on their own. They help out, but they're just sort of like, they're really driven and helpful, and they, you empower them, they take off and just do something on their own, okay? So there's, there's lots of different types of participation. And then the uh, question though is what role does culture play um, and does, it, does this affect who participates? We're gonna come to the issues of uh, diversity and inclusion in just a moment, um, but there's sort of traditions on who might help run things. Okay. What does participation mean to each stakeholder and, and how will they do that? Will it come in the forms on the previous slide? Will they have to do physical labor? Will they just be asked to think and brainstorm? What will they be asked for? So why is it important and to which stakeholders is it important? So one of the crucial issues here came up on the last lecture was if you want to get a group of people to work together to change the community, there ought to be something in it for every individual. I mean, if there's not something really in it for them, are they really going to do something? I mean, they got to see not only that it helps their friends, but that it helps them in some way, generally speaking. It's not always true. So who should participate? You know, these are hard questions because, you know, should the, should the, which men, which women, should children participate? Is that appropriate or not? Um, depends on what roles do people want to play. They're going to generally choose their roles. You're not going to walk in and boss people around. That, that certainly won't work. Um, and then on what things should there be participation? This is a little tricky in engineering because you're walking in with this huge set of technological knowledge. And then do you ask them, you know, what? Okay. I mean, so when sh can they and should they be involved? Um, so what are the constraints for each stakeholder? What that means is that <coughs> people in life have many responsibilities. Just like you guys, you guys are all busy with a lot of other stuff in your life. 
I mean, I have to remind myself of this every day that you're not just taking this class, right? <laughs> so everybody's busy with stuff. Everybody's very busy. So these people in the community, they're not, you know, they're busy generally. They have to, they're worried about their next meal. They're worried about survival generally. And, you know, if you're not coming in something with something that's going to relate to their survival, they're just going to forget it. Okay? Um, reminds me of my, my, my uh, cousin, who's just a great guy. He uh, he's now helps run the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He, he spent a couple years in Honduras doing the Peace Corps stuff, so he had done community nutrition as his undergraduate minor, and he was going to go. Peace Corps said, great, we need this community nutrition in Honduras. He arrives there, and he's like thinking vitamins and micronutrients, and, and he's like, this is not going to work. They don't even have water. So he spent his whole time, years, doing water, getting people water. Just threw the whole thing out, okay? So there's a lot of good reasons to do what people need because it's important to them. Um, so we'll listen, participation increase demand for good governance by creating a more engaged citizenry. So they're speaking in general here, they're thinking of a, a community as like a city and if you get them working together, are they gonna start making, get organized and start getting empowered and start demanding things from the upper levels in government, such as a state government. Uh, so stages. Now, some of, the, some of the words are a little unusual when you first see them. The first word is, they use always is step is research. Okay, that is not what we call research. Okay, what they call research is going out and figuring out what the community needs, okay? Um, so you try to figure out needs and assets. We'll talk more about that when we talk about participatory action research. Next is design, you invent a solution. That doesn't mean, this is a very general framework. Participatory development, you'll notice I'll bring up technology very little. It's a general development methodology. So for, for when we see that invent solution, it means invent technology. But if somebody else comes in and has to invent a solution, it could be something with respect to empowerment of women that has nothing to do with technology. It could be something about the democracy and governance of a community that has nothing to do with technology, perhaps. So. You have to interpret it the way you like. And then the implementation says you make it happen. You do monitoring and evaluation. Um, and so getting people to participate, you have to figure out what's in it for them. Do things so everybody's getting something and make it clear. And you try to be a catalyst. Now, being socially inclusive, uh, the authors spend a fair amount of time discussing this issue. And it's a very difficult issue. It, 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 let's say you walk into a, a, a community and uh, you say, okay, I'd like to um, meet with a group, focus group. And you know there's various cultural and gender role issues in this community, so you ask to see both the men and the women guy, for instance. And if it doesn't happen, if only the men show up, what do you do? Okay, that's tough. As a man, if I'm in a community, you think I can walk around and talk to everybody in the community? Probably not. I can walk around and talk to the men in the community, but if I'm seen as going to a man's home with, when his wife is home alone, talking to her, <clears throat> in some context, you're laughing. This is a problem, right? This is a problem. Talking to children? Uh-uh. Generally speaking, uh-uh. You gotta be really sensitive in this situation, okay? For you women, can you walk around the village and talk to everyone? You got the same problems as me, okay? You can walk around and talk to the men if they're home alone. It might not be a good idea for your own security, right? These are just pragmatics, you know? I mean, just pragmatics. So can you walk around and talk to the children? Well, in some cultures, perhaps, but not necessarily. I know of a culture, uh, let's see, how can I say this without naming? I know of a country where, um, if you're educating in a school and you're an outsider, you cannot touch the children. Period. Period. You will. You absolutely will not touch the children. You're asked not to touch the children. You know, when we were in Colombia a couple weeks ago, I mean, when you're leaving, you give the kids a hug because you work with them all day. I mean, it's very normal. And, and it, I mean, you know, so it, it's a different cultural thing. In some cultures, you can do that in the United States too, but not with every culture in the United States. Uh uh. So you gotta be really careful with these kind of issues of you know, how to include, how you can interact, how you're perceived. Um, so th those are just you know, realities that you gotta deal with, okay? 
Next, they ask the question if for every project will participation work? Valid question. Every, will, will it work for every development problem? They're asking these questions that, that, because they're not sure, okay? Is it, is it right, the right time to use a participatory approach in the community? What if the community just came off of some natural disaster, a hurricane, whatever? Are they really ready to start on something or not? Um, so will you as a facilitator unduly influence stated preferences? This is a real problem because you think you can walk in and say, you know, look at assets, what are your assets, what are your needs? But if you start saying, if they look at you and say, you're a high tech engineer, you know, you say, well, maybe we could do this. They might just say, yes. Well, why? Because they're not sure what to do and they think you're suggesting what to do. They, might, they may think, well, it's not that useful. What if we let this person do this, then maybe they'll come back and help again. But they may not need it. This is, this is a difficult issue. Um, will these identified needs by the community be shaped by what can be delivered instead of expressing true needs? Oh, that's a tough one too. Because they have perceptions. You know, like they may say, we've been trying to fix our water problem here for 20 years or whatever. And you're walking in telling me we can do water or we can do, do sanitation or something like that. And they say, they're thinking, water's not possible. Let's do this. Okay, but they don't know what your tricks are in your bag, right? They don't know about team, what is it, team two? I mean, or, or the other team is doing water. They, they don't know what you can do necessarily. Okay, so that makes it uh, difficult. Start to see why, reasons why communication is difficult. Communication matters a lot especially if you don't speak the language. So will a, a participation requirement result in forced labor for the poor, especially if they're forced to contribute more than the wealthier members of society? The wealthier members is, are the ones you may be talking to. And they say, well, yeah, we can get participation. Just make this guy do this, or this woman do this. <laughs> you know, they might be, remember what Paulo Ferre said, you know, the, the oppressed will oppress the oppressed. Okay, they'll, they'll, they'll do that. So this becomes a difficult issue. This <coughs> issue also is problematic with respect to children and the involvement of children. You know, we can look like forced labor. Okay, um, this piece was particularly important, I think, for humanitarian engineering out of their book, um, and that is that communities are really not as effective at maintaining projects that are technologically complex or new. Um, and you know this is something they learn from a lot of experience and this is a big concern here you know what's the old uh, saying in engineering kiss right keep it simple stupid okay in other words you go into the situation you better make sure you keep this simple to operate understand maintain right so that it's successful for the long term you do something really complex and, you know is it only gonna last till 10 minutes after you leave Okay, just ask about the humanitarian engineering projects that run out of this college and ask how long they succeeded. 05, student group goes to Montani de Luz, convert a morgue into a computer lab, put in computers, brought the computers from Ohio State. How long did they last? Hmm, we're not sure. They certainly weren't working when we came back a year later. Okay, so it's depressing. It's really depressing. Uh, so is it really feasible to involve a large number of people in the development process and what's the right number? This can be a difficult problem too, of course. Um, and then can the strategy be scaled up to apply to other, other areas? It may be that it's only gonna be possible to have a local strategy in each area. That seems, what, that seems to me to be the right conclusion. Next, community capacity. What are your crucial assets? What's your technical capacity? Do not assume because no one has a higher education that they don't have engineering capacity, technological capacity. Don't assume that. There can be some fantastic capacity right there in front of you. Typically those are the sort of mechanically inclined people that can kind of build contraptions and sort of very handy and can do things. Um, a capacity for action, which means they just take initiative and get things done for operation and maintenance. Can they sort of get, keep it working? 
Then there's the problem of capture and corruption. The book spends quite a bit of time. So capture means you, you capture things. You capture decision making. Okay, so that you can make sure that the goodies end up with you if you're the boss of the village. Okay? Corruption means that if money comes into the picture, it's not directed to the project, but put in somebody's pocket, right? Um, and all kinds of other things, it's not just money, it's resources, activities. How does it, who, who really benefits, okay? Who pays, who benefits? Um, are really um, big issues. So there's a number of ways to learn about a community. Um, in some ways, this is one of the most important steps. Um, this is the so-called funnel approach. So in this, you, you set a foundation. You go build relationships, build trust. Um, you listen and understand their perceptions and cultural norms. Sort of a get to know each other stage. This is, you know, can take quite a bit of time, okay? Um, you explore broader socioeconomic issues, priorities, problems, needs, and opportunities. Earlier stuff we've done in this class, right? We investigate specific issues, okay, with respect to technologies or, or with respect to uh, water or sanitation or energy, causes and effects, options, and how everybody kind of communicates and gets along with them, and then you define the needed change. As a group, okay, the whole community is deciding this. So this area called participatory action research was invented by Falls Borda, a Colombian actually. You're back in the 60s and 70s, he developed this idea in Latin America. And uh, it, this is very, very widely used. I mean, this is in Homan's book, okay, that's taught over in the College of Social Work. Um, so what you do is you invite the, in, integrally involve the community to determine the needs and resources. In other words, the engineering team does not walk in and go survey people and figure it out. You get a group to join the team, and then you all do it. Okay? And let, in, in fact, you may only send them out to ask, but you work together to figure it out, and uh, it's been found that you do a better job this way. So you don't you know, view them as subjects to gather data on, why I just go out and get surveys and get data. It's much more complex than that, okay? So this empowers the clients and community in, in a significant way. Uh, some aspects of PAR, you want to deepen your understanding about how to act, okay? Um, and then the actions um, lead to sort of new and transform relationships. And then the people that are affected by this, um, um, understand how the study was done, how to use the results, and the information is gathered then because the community is part of helping learn about the community. The community owns the information. The community understands itself better, which is a, be a side benefit independent of any technology or solution that you implement. Um, so it's, it's for building power in the community and it's collaborative. Um, and, uh, but it does require some critical self-examination um, by the whole group. So you reflect, plan, act, observe. It sounds like praxeology, right? It sounds like feedback. Um, you generate theories, you take act plans, you take actions, and you keep repeating that, okay? Um, you generate ideas or hypotheses, and you test it, um, and you and that analyze fi findings, you distribute information. So generally, there's PAR at two levels. There, you assess conditions, issues, and needs. That's the assessment level. Of course, we need that for technology design, right? Those things at the top are what set constraints, technical design constraints. You're finding out your projects, right? That's what's setting the, the, what you're going to do. Then you focus on a selected um, issue or condition, trying to understand it better. Guides what you do and you test it. So this is the action level, the assessment level. You figure out what to do, you focus on it, and then you take action, okay? So the way to do this start out is convene and educate a PAR group. So you sit down and you get a group, of, you somehow invite a group of people. Uh, I've heard of different approaches for this. Some people will uh, uh, walk around the community and just verbally ask people, hey, you, we're trying to figure this out, you want to help? Other people will literally send an a written invitation because it feels special, okay? So it's not clear how, how culturally it's best to approach something like this at all. But you get this group together and you ask the following questions. What are we looking at? What do we need 
what do we know or need to know? What's our hypothesis? Okay, because in that group, they're probably you know when you got the clients right there, the community members, you say you know what do we need to look at? And they're gonna, there's going to be a few people who are going to say you know what the problem here is water. Another person say no, it's sanitation. Another person will say no, it's energy. And, and you're going to have a broad idea of what to even start asking just because you've got them on board. That's hugely valuable. Okay, um, and then. What do we have that we can use? In other words, you ask these people, what are our assets? Right? It sets the right tone. There is no community that doesn't have assets. There's some assets, because there are people there, and those are assets, right? So you always have assets. And then later on, as the group starts figuring things out, you ask them, well, what are we gonna do? And uh, we're gonna see if the actions produced by the result we predicted and then we're going to analyze the whole situation and try to refine things and keep moving forward. Um, so after the assessment and actions, what the group needs to do is determine how to use the assets and resource to implement something. Um, they might test something, like an outcome, and uh, they might even use data for that. Um, and if it was successful, they might implement it and go forward. And then determine what happened, see if you need to change things. Do you see the loop? That's that feedback loop, okay? It's, it's this cycle that you go through. It's important to see the cycle and what are at the stages of the cycle because that's gonna give you when you're with, in a very complex situation in a community, some way to think about process and how to approach a very uh, dynamic and very uncertain situation. Um, so, how to define needs and resources. A community with unmet, it has unmet needs. You want to clarify what they are. You want to determine the range. So you might find out, say there's three needs here. You want to figure out what those three are. And then figure out the process, how you're going to get the information. If, are people just going to walk around? If it's too big of a community, that's not going to happen. So you, got, you, you have to tailor this information gathering strategy to the community. Um, and then how will you interpret the information? Engineers have a high propensity towards getting data, right? And then taking averages and standard deviations. That's not gonna always work. It certainly is not always gonna work. Sometimes just qualitative things like enthusiasm or you know, this issue of empowerment or different issues of capacity, they're very difficult to quantify. You're not gonna be able to, so you're gonna have to do a combined quantitative and qualitative assessment. All right, and then of course all this is constrained by time and money. How long will you be in location or in the country? And who gets the information? The community owns the information, that's who owns it. And then how are you gonna use it? So who are you gonna to talk to? Are you gonna be inclusive? Can you? See, it's much easier, you see another, now we're returning to that issue of what I talked about that had to do with gender and children. If I've got community members with me, it's pretty easy to go around and talk to anybody in the community, right? It's no question about it. So that's another good reason to have somebody from the community with you. Aside, besides that, if you don't know the language, they're going to have to be their translator if they know language, okay? Um, and then there's focus groups that you could run to. Um, so you ask about needs and resources. Question is, you talk to leaders or not? You know, you, you go into a, a situation like this and the leaders could be very, very well liked and you have to talk to them. Or they can be very, very much un disliked and you may still have to talk to them. And once you talk to them, you're associated with them by other community members. You're, you're viewed as having an alliance. So you can get yourself in some pretty weird situations because of, you're walking into a power structure in a very complex situation. You don't, you're just like, you know, a bowl in a china store, you can be just making a mess. Okay, so it's very tricky. Um, yeah, sure, you can do a survey. Okay, so participatory uh, monitoring and evaluation. Um, are the stakeholders happy? Um, are the changes and updates needed? We agree to the approach for monitoring and evaluation right up front. And then we're gonna agree that we're gonna run a survey or we're gonna agree that we're gonna interview several people from the village and ask how things are going. I, this, in the development literature, 
across the literature, from what I've seen, there is a huge stress on monitoring and evaluation. This process is crucial because you got to sort of see how the project's going. If it's just, we call it, in feedback control, you call it open loop. You know, if you don't look at the outputs, forget it, right? You can't, you can't control well. There's no way because of uncertainty. So uh, it's not surprising there's a sort of emphasis across the literature and in particular in participatory um, development. As I said, we use quantitative and qualitative assessment. You track the progress um, and into the future. So it's sort of like you, you start gathering information on how well you're succeeding as you're going. At some point you may, for some projects it sort of ends in a sense, but then you keep going because as you know, there, there's every technology, even if you deployed it, you know, it's, it's uh, performance is gonna degrade at some point, right? Technologies fall apart. Everything falls apart. There's an old saying, right? Things fall apart. Okay, so you know, some type. The problem is, is that monitoring things out in the future is, ah, oh, it's like, oh, forget it. It's expensive. It's time. It takes too much time, etc. So it doesn't happen a lot of the time. And that's a problem. So with respect, to, they also say that you need to monitor um, the stakeholders too continuously. You know, the power relationships, influence, interest, you know, people are gonna come and go in the participation process. It's not like you're gonna get someone and they're gonna stay with you the whole time. They may drop out because their, their husband's sick and they gotta take care of him or their whatever. Whatever it is, something might happen. So you gotta keep in touch with all this kind of stuff too. Um, there's something called participatory rural appraisal, appraisal that's um, uh, popular in some circles um, and uh, so this is uh, a collaborative planning for developing assessing interventions it can involve rural and urban people insiders and outsiders and use visual techniques it's sort of a traditional methodology you see these people here um, doing this um, these women right here from I don't know what South Asian country um, so they, they, they're, they get together as a group try to assess how things are going and, and traditionally agricultural prof projects, you know, are we, you know, um, irrigating properly? Are we using the right seed? Are we using the right fertilizer? Where are we planting next? If we have a community garden, how are we coordinating its use? Is it getting fair use? There's tons and tons of questions that it can be used. And of course, food's of fundamental importance. It's, it's essentially almost as important as water, right? Uh, then you have to assess the beneficiaries. Um, so you try to look at who's getting what, the people that are benefiting, um, and you try to identify what challenges there are, or create new initiatives, and ask if they're still you know, doing their fair share, for instance, and then get their feedback for improvement. The beneficiaries should be the ones that are most interested in helping out to determine how the project's going, and helping out. It shouldn't be that there's people that are beneficiaries that have made no contribution, unless they're disabled or a child, for instance, okay? Um, more on participatory evaluation. So this involves everyone to try to understand problems, collect, analyze information, generate recommendations. So it's like having a PAR team, send them out, doing needs and asset assessment, but this team also may be the team that is doing monitoring evaluation over time and saying how things are going. Okay, so when you come back, they can say, yeah, things are going great, or no, we got all kinds of problems. Um, and then, impact. So you wanna know if you are having impact. So are they positive or negative impacts? You know, positive impact is what you're looking for, of course, but you often don't think about negative impacts. You bring in some technology and, or multiple copies of a technology, and suddenly you put somebody out of business that was selling the same technology to people. Econ bad economic side effect, okay? Um, you, have, you figure out that you have a new approach to sanitation, but it's having an adverse effect on the environment, all right, that you didn't think about. So you're, you're always trying to look at positive and negative impacts. Uh, also on individuals and, and their social relationships on the in households or community. Um, so there's, there's really, again, you have the group doing the impact analysis. So uh, you want to, of course, I mean, you know, if you're concerned with human development index, it, it's income, health, and education, all right? So are you positively impacting those, and how do you measure that? 
That can be very difficult. Um, and then there's, you might be able to quantify these things, perhaps, but how are you going to quantify all this stuff? How do you quantify empowerment or participation? Count the number of hours they're working. How hard were they working? Group capacity to perform projects together. Forget it. You're not going to be able to quantify something like that. You could score and take a guess, but it's, it's going to be impossible. So some things that matter a lot cannot be put to numbers. And I think it's really an important point because you, you, somebody will say to you, what impact did you have in Honduras on this project? Well, you might be able to say, well, we, you know, we reduced the you know, contaminants in drinking water for 20 people. And I'll, okay, but what was, what, who cares about contaminants in drinking water if you're not drinking it? Maybe they just use bottled water anyway. So, so what, what real impact on health did you have of these people? And then how did, of course, that's important in its own right, but it's also important with respect to economic, economics and with respect to education. So quantifying impact is, is really quite um, difficult. Uh, and it has many benefits because you can say, for sure, we did this. You walk away from these projects, um, and we do it at Ohio State, um, it, it feels really good to be able to say, we did this, okay? We achieved this. Yes? I just want to say that as engineers, we are used to saying, like, what did you do? Like, tell me, like, physically what did you do? Yeah. And because I went to Honduras this last, like, spring break, like, I realized that the impact of going on these trips is not only what you do, like, it's not only like the physical thing that you do, but like the time that you share with the people, like, has a big impact on them too. For example, one of the things that for me was like really, I don't know, like, really touching was like, because you were there like doing something, like seeing little kids saying like, hey, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? How do you do that? You know what? I want to be an engineer too. So maybe you are not having like an impact in a big community, but just because one little kid in all the trip tell you like, hey, I want to be an engineer too, just because he saw you doing something, I think that that's like really inspiring. I you said it well. I agree completely. Anybody else want to comment along those lines? I can give you examples. I'm on a plane going back, relaxed, and I was like, was any of that worthwhile? And often I come back to these issues. I come back to this stuff. I claim that um, those things like that, so, uh, you can call it solidarity if you want, but just the relations, just, just joking around, chatting. I mean, it matters to these people, and it matters to me. And it's just like, I don't know if you know, but Montaña is like, it's a place where like, kids with HIV live there. So maybe a lot of these kids, like usually, like people don't treat them well, or you know, like because they are gonna think like, oh no, they have HIV, I don't wanna touch them, and they go to a lot of discrimination. So I think that, when a, when a group like us, that it was like a group of students, like the one that was, the older was, was like 21, and they shared them with the kids, and they will hug the kids, and they don't care. So you are showing these kids like love. So yeah. you, are giving them, you are giving them like a week where you are showing them that you care about them, and you are teaching them a lot of things. So as engineers, Usually you are you think like oh yeah but did you tell me what you did or because I heard someone once telling me like oh you go to Honduras each student pays like twenty five hundred for the trip and you are going to do something like why you don't just donate that money and the people in Honduras like contract someone that will do what you are gonna do better than you and I was like well yeah you can take twenty five hundred per student and donate someone, donate their money, but the student, like the little kids there are not gonna get the experience or sharing their time with you. So I think that what is the value in the money that you're giving is not like the project that you're going to go there and implement. Yeah, maybe it's not gonna be perfect, it's not gonna be like for, well, you spend one week and if you pay to someone, that person will do it in one day, you know? But it's like the time that you are sharing with the kids, the time that you are sharing, like, 
that I have to expand during that project too because I think that the feels as a junior too, when you think like, oh, I'm gonna do this, 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 and when you go there and you realize like, oh, I say that I was going to build the first day, but a pipe broke or whatever, and so you start like finding obstacles on your way, and on your way that make you like plan ahead. You know, like, I don't know. So I think that what is worth is like the experience more than just go yeah. and give them on it. Other comments like, like this or comments on what Issa is saying? Yeah. I think going over there and helping out really kind of just takes out that cover from your in front of your eyes and you actually see what the situation is so that you can better connect to people and <coughs> to their problems. If you just pay someone to solve the problems, you, you would say like, okay, I'm done. I, I just paid my money. I, I contributed my share. But you never get to see what other people are actually experiencing. So I agree. Yeah, something more like for that line. There were two students that it was like the first time that they went outside of the United States. So I think that it, I don't know if how many of you have gone outside of the United States, but a country like Honduras is a really poor country. Even for me, that I'm from Colombia, and I have seen like, I don't know, like poor people, that for me it was really shocking to see how poor that country is. So I can see, and I saw how like shocked some of the students were because they are used to living here when, I don't know, they have everything that they want, and going there and seeing this, like, living there for one week, sharing with these people, realizing that, yeah, they are poor, but you will find the most thankful people there. The mo what, most what the people? Most thankful. Like, thankful. They are really thankful for everything that they Are they have. happy? They are really happy. You go to the school, and the kids are playing with tires. They just jump from one tire to another, and they are like the most happy kids ever. So you're like, oh my god, like, sometimes I complain because I don't have money for this, because I don't have this, because I don't have this, and these people have almost nothing, and they are like the most happy people ever. So I think that is like really a good experience for the students. Agreed. Radhika, did you have a comment? Um, I think I would definitely agree with that. Um, I've met people who, have absolutely no desire to leave the Midwest, let alone the United States. And it just like kind of blows my mind a little bit um, just because the amount of um, experience that you get just leaving the states and going somewhere else, leaving the developed world and going to any other country. Um, and you, it really, really opens your eyes. So I think that, yeah, part of it is not just what did you do for a community as far as the numbers, but it's, even for yourself, you grow so much as a person just no. hopping a border and, and seeing what it's like on the other side. So I've been joking with people lately, uh, just to pick up on some of the things that are said. I, I know I'm getting uh, far afield perhaps, but it doesn't matter. Uh, we're talking about metrics and impact, right? And what the impact was. So, so the question is to, so get this, um, two weeks ago, Gallup poll, that's the major survey organization in the United States, came out with a, a, a ranking of countries by how many positive emotions they have, the people. And there's like five questions. So just think of it as positive emotions and happiness, okay? So number one country in the world is who? Norway. Where? Norway. They're the richest. They're, I mean, per capita. That doesn't have anything to do with happiness. No. Bhutan. Bhutan. Ooh, you're good. No. I know why you guessed that. Bhutan. Uh, Paraguay. Who's number two? Isa. Colombia. Colombia. Colombia is number two. Number three is another Latin American country. Number four is Guatemala. So I was joking with somebody last week. I said, do you think I'm going down to Colombia to help? Oh, heck no. I'm going down there to get help. <laughs> to get a sense of humor and to learn how to dance salsa. <laughs> right? I mean, but there is some truth in that. I mean, people are happy, man. You know? I mean, there, there's something to it. I mean, there, I have fun on these trips. I do, honestly. Because I think the people are just fantastic. They're, they're fun. Okay? So, so... It, these things are complicated, but should our metric for helping and whether we have impact 
be like the HDI, like on um, back here, you know, income, income, health, and education. There's a, other countries that say, no, it should be happiness, period. I think Bhutan's one of those that comes out real high on it, right? That's why you said that, I think. Yeah. They come out really high, and they aren't they the country that had initiative in this, saying, that, look, you guys are all wrong. It's about happiness. Okay, so I don't know what to say is the right metric. I mean, come on. Who knows what the right metric is? They said, in, in the religious people in the room, I don't know who you are, but there's probably someone here. Spirituality, God. That's the metric. Okay, so is it, is it God? Is it, is it um, happiness? Self-fulfillment? Is it human dignity? Is it income? Is it health? Is it education? I mean, I have no idea. I think what it is, what, what Marsha Sen would say is, it's what you define it to be as an individual. If, if I want to destroy my health by, by education, just, just teaching myself everything, get 20 PhDs at OSU, that would make me overjoyed, very happy. Don't make such a funny face. <laughs> but you see my point, though? It's up to me to make my own happiness and fulfillment. If it's with respect to God, if it's with respect to religion, whatever. And those are your personal choices, and they're their personal choices. Now, so if you go in a, a community and they don't seem real, I, I'll, I'll give you one case. Uh, I, I, I'm in uh, Honduras, and I'm trying to work with this guy, and he just wants to talk, you know, and I, I wanted to practice my Spanish, and he just wanted to chat and sit around and talk. And I'm like, come on, let's get going, man, let's get going. And I just said, well, screw it. I'm, I'm sitting down, I'm talking to this guy, and I, it was really nice. It was a lot of fun. And, you know, I hear from people in this business, this happens to a lot of Americans, Americans are like, bam, bam, bam. They want that schedule. They want to get that time. What does the person you're working with want to do? They want to sit down and get to know you. So who should you listen to? I'm convinced it's them. That's what they value. You go with it. Yes, do you agree? Uh, what you just say, like, before we go to Honduras, we try to tell the students, like, hey, don't expect everything to be on time. Like, Latin American culture is like, we are always late. Like, we take, like, It's, it's, those are where your memories are, yeah. right? It's, I mean, and that's where their memories are. So what's most important, you know? I mean, in, in Colombia, I danced salsa choque with a young Colombian woman for the first time. Now, if you, if you go to YouTube and look at salsa choque, it's not that kind of dance, okay? I mean, it's very sexual. This was... So she's trying to teach me to dance. I'm terrible, absolutely terrible dancer. I cannot dance. And she's trying to teach me. I step on her toes. I mean, it was a disaster. And then finally I looked at her and said in Spanish, I am going to switch to how I danced when I was young, which is rock and roll. <laughs> and she's like, like she gave me this, what? And I kind of melded salsa and rock and roll. And she was like, wow. Which shocked me because I, rock and roll just to me means you just do whatever. It doesn't, you know what I'm saying? I mean, there's no, it's completely crazy. But that's fun. That's a fantastic memory. You know, she's a young engineering student and women engineering associated with IEEE at um, Pasto at Universidad de Nariño. Okay? So, you know, but anyway, the point is, have fun. 
And, that, and I think it's have fun on both sides. You're an ambassador, right? You're an ambassador first. Okay, any other comments? I'm going to, uh, lessons learned. It's best with a responsive state, which means they need the government to help out. And the national and local context is very important. These are the lessons, the main three lessons learned from this huge study by the World Bank. These three things. The last one is community engagement is really complicated and it's unpredictable and who knows what's going to happen. Okay? So just along the lines of being humorous, I have a, a series of jokes. See, I was ready for this. Well, no, I, I didn't know the conversation was going to go this direction. Okay, so get this. <laughs> Isn't that great? I mean, the far side, unbelievable. So in participatory, I'm going to make this relevant, actually. In participatory development, did you listen well and did you communicate well? Do you see the relevance of the cartoon? I have been in situations where their English is bad, my Spanish isn't good, we're going back and forth, and I think I understand them, I think they understand me, and I'm way wrong, okay? So this is a very complicated situation to deal with. Second one, or second and third. So were you technically competent? I like this one. Check, can you read this? I'll read it to you. The, the guy's on the phone, starting, his daughter's in here, they're doing homework together. Uh, yeah, homework help line? Uh, I need to have you explain quadratic equation in roughly this, the amount of time it takes to get a cup of coffee. Because he told his daughter he was going to get a cup of coffee. All right, so um, you're not going to be able to call back to the US and talk to some expert, like a professor or a student, to get help when you're down in Honduras, for instance, and trying to solve a technical problem. This one, I love this. Was your technology robust? So get this one. This is hilarious. So the National Museum of Etch a Sketch Art. Structurally, the building was fine, but sadly, the earthquake destroyed all of our art pieces. <laughs> Isn't that great? Sorry. I, I, was, I was doing this at 5 a.m. this morning, and I was laughing in my kitchen. Anyway, that's all I have. <laughs> all right. <laughs>